So when the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, Shall I kill them, my father? Isn't that nice when you live in a nation when the spiritual kings rule over the natural kings? Remember when guys like Billy Graham used to go to the White House and we had things like National Day of Prayer and things? Remember those days? Weren't they sweet days? Gosh, that was just a couple years ago, wasn't it? When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elijah, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, the prophet said. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. And so he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. And so the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. I want you to look at this story because this story is incredible. From Elisha and his servant all the way to what's going on with the Aramites and all this interplay. The whole story revolves around the things that we all personally relate to. Emotional things. Things that cause fear are things that cause peace. Things that can bring death are things that can bring life. Everything in this story, the fear or the peace of Elijah's servant hinged on what he saw. The life and the death of the Aramites hinged on what somebody saw. The life of Israel ended up hinging on what the, what the king of Aram saw after this. Israel was saved, at least for the time being, simply because of vision, revelation, sight. People being able to see something they could not see. And God shows us this story that, that is full of redundancy when it comes to vision. And He's simply trying to say, let me tell you, everything that matters to your life depends on one thing. What you see or don't see. The servant looks out and based on what he sees, he is filled with fear and they're getting ready to just be destroyed. He looks again and he sees with new vision. Suddenly he's at peace and suddenly everything changes. Two men that were going to go on the defensive suddenly are in an offensive posture. Suddenly they're calling the shot. Everything changed. Ownership of a city. Rule over a city. Everything changed on one thing. What somebody saw. It's powerful. It's powerful. Vision. Revelation. For lack of vision, my people perish. NIV version. For lack of of revelation, my people cast off restraint. They are not focused. They are not set. They are not running their race. They cast off all restraints in life. They're just going here and there and everywhere. They're bebopping all over the place. They're not accomplishing anything with their life because they have no revelation. They have no vision. They cannot see what's actually there. Powerful stuff. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about seeing things that was there the whole time that we couldn't see. Take it another look, a deeper look. It's all mixed up now in my mind. I don't remember what we've talked about and what Sunday. This song though, that we did a little while ago came out of, uh, of, the, of the one message, Oh, taste and see. See that God is good. You've got to see that. If you can't see that God is good, then you will think that God is not good. He is bad and He is mad. And that makes you sad. <laughs> All in how you see God. Your life will totally hinge on how you see God. Oh, taste and see that God is good. What if you can't see that God is good? How does that affect your life? Condemnation, guilt, shame, run from God. No disciplines whatsoever in the areas of serving or, or giving, as my wife said, or just, just being who God made you to be. No restraints, no disciplines, no focus. Based on who I think God is, how do I see God? We, we've talked about, about how we see each other. Because we're so quick to look at someone and say, well, there's 99 good things about them, probably that one thing, I just can't get past that one thing. And we'll throw away 99 good things because of one bad thing, because that's what we're focused on, that's what we see. This story is a story uh, that says, no, go look again beyond the natural. There's more there than what you saw. You have no vision, you have no revelation. Open the eyes of your heart, see what's really there. And Elisha's servant was transformed because of it. 
Jesus came to the blind man. He said, open your eyes. And what do you see? He said, I see men as, as, as great trees. He said, go back. I'm going to touch you again. Look at the same thing. The same sight. The same view. Look again. And when he looked again after a second touch, he saw something different. Just like Elisha's servant saw something different. He went and looked out the same window at the same thing. And stories like this remind us that we don't need a change in view. We need to change how we're viewing our view. You need to hear that. We always think we need a new view. I need a new husband. I need a new wife. I need new children. I hate the last ones. The cats had a great idea. I need a different job. I need a different church. I need a different pastor. I, 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 I need a different uh, this. I need a different that. I need a different car. I need a different that. I, I'm always needing to change my landscape in life. And yet the Bible is full of redundant stories where God has reminded us, look, look out the window. Look at what you've been looking at, but look again. I want to show you things you haven't seen. It's the story of Elijah's servant. He looked out the same view with a different view. The blind man, he looked right back out at those same men walking, but he saw them different suddenly. If you were here Wednesday night, uh, we were talking about this within the framework of the book of Hebrews. The book that I thought was the most complex book in the New Testament. So complex that I hardly ever preach out of it because it's just too hard to break down because it's, it's a very theologically loaded book. And unless you've got a bunch of people that's got some pretty solid foundations, it's hard to go very far in the book of Hebrews. And, and, and the Lord gave me this deep revelation the other night of how unbeat the book really was. It's simply the writer, whether it be Paul or whoever it was, simply saying to the Hebrews, this is one of the books that was actually written to the Jews. And it was God's way of saying to them, I want you to go back out there and I want you to look at all the things you're used to looking at. Things that you have been seeing, generations prior to you have been seeing these same things, the, 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 the same landscape. I want, you, I want you to go look at all the things you used to look at. Go, go look at the temple, the, the worship in the temple. Go look at the priesthood and the order of the priesthood. You've been passing down stories of Melchizedek as long as you can remember for generations. That great mystery. You all love telling stories about Melchizedek. Go back and look at go back and look at the same things you've been looking at for generations. Only this time, I want you to see something you've never seen before. That's all the book is about. He's saying you're used to looking at the priests. You're used to looking at all these stories of Melchizedek, all these things. You're used to looking at the temple and the structure and the worship. You're used to looking at these things. You've been looking, you know this stuff inside out. Go back and look at it again. And this time I want you to see something you've never seen. I'm going to give you a different view of your view. Redundantly, the Bible holds this scenario. Go back and look again. God's not going to change the view. He's going to change how you view your view. We need a new view of the old view is what I'm trying to tell you.